episode 71 of the podcast. This week, we are talking about consent. Um, Hey now, don't roll your eyes. Consent isn't a wishy-washy, granola-crunchy, feel-good topic. It's actually the goal for grooming visits, vet visits, and other care. It's a dog choosing to go with the flow and allow us to work with them. Every example of a dog who is awesome for grooming and vet visits is a dog who is choosing to play along, a dog who is consenting. You're listening to the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast. I'm Chrissy Newmeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, a certified behavior consultant for canines, a certified professional dog trainer, and the owner of Happy Critters in Nashua, New Hampshire. And this, my friends and colleagues, is the podcast where grooming and training meet. Today we're talking about cooperation and consent. So what is consent? Let's start there. The dictionary defines it as permission for something to happen or agreement to do something. Hmm, interesting, right? Because sometimes the term consent gets associated with wishy-washy, new agey, granola crunchy stuff, right? Like somebody's eyes are rolling right now. (laughs) And I've been there. I've been one of the eye rollers like, oh my God, really? Consent? Like what? But is it something that we want in grooming? And heck yes. So let's talk more about what consent means for us. Because when I think about the dogs who are a joy to groom, or are wonderful for vet visits, they're the dogs who are going with the flow. And by going with the flow, what they're really doing is they're willing to let us do stuff and things to them, to them, with them, and around them. The dogs who are difficult to groom or to provide veterinary care for are the dogs who want to go away, move away from you, or otherwise make the stuff and things stop. And I would describe them as dogs who are not agreeing to do something, are not giving permission for something to happen. And that's really where it comes down to. That's, that's where that consent is, is are they agreeing or not? Are they playing along with us or not? So at the core of what we're looking for is a dog who's going to go with the flow and let us do our stuff and things. Now, in this episode, I'm going to refer to stuff and things, but, you know, I really want you to think the all-encompassing that's that's nail trims, that's drying near ears, that's taking a blood sample, that's, you know, lifting a tail, that's looking at an injury, that's, you know, looking in their ears for an ear exam, you know, that's all of it. So I'm going to say stuff and things to them, on them, around them, and with them, (laughs) because not all of it is them working with us. Some of it's just them allowing us to work on them. Consent is really important. So I went down the rabbit hole this week and rec- and researched it and found there are four types of consent. They are, there's implied consent, there's informed consent, expressed consent, and unanimous consent. And I'm going to discuss each of them separately. Implied consent, it's a uh, the, the way it was defined was inferred by actions and circumstances. A human example is physical contact during a boxing match, right? That kind of physical contact of boxing is not appropriate anywhere else. But when they're in a boxing match, it's kind of implied that you're going to hit each other, <laughs> right? It's physical. It is not the social norm. It's an implied consent inferred by the actions and circumstances of that place, Um, It's the, we're here for this, and it's what we do here. In dog grooming, in vet terms, I would say that that's that's the version that we see as the great dog, but we don't always recognize that it's consent. It seems more like a dog who just isn't bothered, right? The dog that's just, you know, going with the flow, doesn't really care much, doesn't doesn't fight with us. That dog is making an active choice to go with the flow, and in fact, is giving their permission. They are giving their consent. So every awesome dog that you've groomed or you've done a vet exam on or that you've had in your hands for some purpose, when they allow you to do it, that is consent. And if I had known that earlier in my career, I wouldn't have rolled my eyes the first couple of times someone said we're looking for consent and teaching consent and grooming. (laughs) Because I did. The first couple of times I'm like, oh my God, really? Now we have to ask the dogs if it's okay to do our job. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I want you to think that we need to recognize that those dogs who are awesome for it, like our gold standard, what we want dogs to be in, in these kind of situations, those are the dogs that are giving their permission. They're playing along. They're choosing because any dog can keep you from doing it. Really think about that for a moment. Any dog is capable of keeping you from doing it. The ones who are really, really good, that's consent, right? And the reason why I'm putting that example under implied consent, because I want you to think, you know, when we get wet, we're in the bathtub. When we get on the table, we're going to be trimmed. When we're at the vet, maybe we're going to get our lungs listened to. Like, I want, I want you to start seeing that these dogs are often just in this circumstance. Maybe they wouldn't want a dryer on their head anywhere else, but they've learned, oh, we're in a grooming setting. We're going to do the grooming things. Or I'm at home and mom's putting me, you know, in the car and we do our car things. These are, these are ways that we can look at the dog who's awesome and that is consent. And I didn't realize it earlier in my career, and now I do. <laughs> so implied consent is about as interesting as watching grass grow. Sometimes it doesn't look like it's a dog who's trying, but they are choosing. Now, informed consent. This one's a similar, but a little bit different. The, their definition was the subject has a clear understanding of what is happening. So the way I would define that for grooming purposes and for veterinary purposes is a dog who has been groomed many times and has a clear understanding of what the expectations are based on their experience. Right? So maybe it took some time for them to get there. You know, maybe they weren't the puppy that was always fantastic for it. But now, you know, they're the dog who is at the vet often enough to catch on to what's going on. And they choose to go with the flow. It's informed consent. They know that this may be unpleasant or boring or noisy, but they'll do it. Informed consent comes with the experience and learning. And um, one of the things that we talk a little bit about is like naming and explaining. And I should probably do another podcast episode on that because I realize I have, <laughs> this is episode 71. So there's a whole bunch of hours and hours and hours of stuff out there. And I don't expect you guys to have listened to all of it. Of course, please listen to all of it, but I don't expect you to. So um, naming and explaining are ways for us to tell a dog, okay, this is, here are the nail trimmers. You know what's coming next. So if we're using informed consent, now I can have them know the things I need to do, the stuff, the, the actions. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, one of the really common ones I use for dogs that have problems with nails, because that's such a common issue, right? Is I'll tell them like, hey, here are the nail trimmers, this foot, and I name it while I'm touching it. This foot, this toe, while I'm touching that toe, line it up, which is where I put my clippers on that toe. Because believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not, if you line the clippers up on their nail and you aren't yet putting pressure on, I've had dogs give me a pretty clear reaction if that was going to be too close to the quick. Because if I move it a little further out and they're calm again, interesting, right? But they definitely are like, okay, that section wouldn't hurt. But line it up. And if they're still calm, and I say snip and then snip it. And on to the next toe and the next toe. And you think about that alone is what, 16 repetitions? Four toes, four feet? right? So, um, but they're learning this is what happens and that's informed consent. I am choosing to follow along with this process that you're teaching me about, we're talking about. And eventually that turns into implied consent. Like, yeah, of course she's going to do that. The nail trimmers are out. So <laughs> there's some overlap. Now, here is a third type of consent We've already talked about implied and informed. This one is expressed consent. Because we're discussing nonverbal creatures, well, okay, dogs can certainly tell us with barks and growls how they feel, but they aren't going to say, yes, you may do my nails. If you have a dog who says, yes, please go ahead and dry my ears, please let me know. Um, <laughs> but when we're talking about nonverbal consent, a human example could just be the nod for yes. Right? Like that's a, do you mind? 
no, okay. You know, <laughs> like there's a way to, to Im- imply that, no, I'm okay with this, right? For dogs, this would be the dog who's choosing to hold their paw still for you or is choosing to stand still. Um, you know, you think about the dog that is um, not wiggling, <laughs> right? That's, con- that's a type of consent. But there are also some ways that we can teach that type of expressed consent. So for grooming purposes, I like the tactile feeling of consent in my hand. So what does that mean? I'm, that means that when I'm holding their paw, I like to be able to open my grip and close it again and have them choose to stay in my hand. I want you to think about that as expressed consent. I had the opportunity to go away, but I am choosing to stay in your hand even though you have the nail trimmers or the dryer and you're telling me exactly what we're going to do next. It's not just a lack of struggling hard, it's the choosing to be there. Now, other types of expressed consent that are more popular, (laughs) especially in the training world, are things like nose targeting and chin targeting. And I want you to think about those are another form of expressed consent. How can I say, yes, I'm on board or no, I am not? Okay, for the dog to say, yes, I am on board, or no, I am not. Now, nose targeting is when a dog touches their nose to a specific area, object, person, thing, you know, but they they have to touch their nose to it. Think about it as like pressing a button. That could be a start button. Sometimes they're actually called start button behaviors. Like, I am pressing the button. That means, yes, you may continue. Now, part of that expressed consent is that when they remove their nose from that target, they're now saying, I need a break. I need a rest, I need some space, right? Like it's an on or off, on or off. I'm touching it or I'm not. I'm touching it and I'm okay with it. I'm pulling away or I'm not okay with it. Now, chin targeting is pretty similar, which is where they rest their chin. And they're resting their chin sometimes on an owner's lap or on a surface or a pillow, um, the edge of a couch, you know, but resting their chin. And that is the same, like it's a start button behavior. It means, yes, while my chin is here, I'm saying you can go ahead. When I move my chin, it means I need a break. Here is my problem with that and grooming. It's a big problem. Um, what if you are working on an area of the dog where you cannot watch their face? <laughs> right? Trainers. Trainers, really think about this. You're working on an area at the back end of a dog. Who is going to see if the dog moves their nose from the start button? Who would see it? And if you're teaching them this contract that um, this is the way you tell me you need a break, and this is the way you tell me that it's okay to continue, and no one's watching, what does that lead to? Because I would say that leads to frustration pretty often. That's pretty frustrating. Like, hey, this is how you're going to tell me you're, you know, you need a break. I'm not going to listen, but you go ahead and say it as much as you'd like. (laughs) Right. But those are examples of expressed consent. The dog is actively being taught to do something specific to say, yes, you can continue and do something specific to say, I need a break from that. And it's a really handy thing because when you go from expressed consent For a dog who has an issue and you start off there, you move on to more of an informed consent and then an implied consent. And of course, implied consent is the, yeah, hey, we're in a grooming room. This is what we do here. (laughs) Um, But expressed consent is more of an education. Um, Now, the fourth type of consent is unanimous consent, general consent. It's kind of a group type of consent from the definition that I looked up. And I really couldn't think of any version for grooming or veterinary or other types of care. Um, I'm sure I'll wake up in the middle of the night with some example because I'm a huge geek and it's what I do. But right now, I just can't think of any. But these first three, I think, really are good examples for us to think about because we do want consent in grooming, right? For the purposes of dog grooming and vet visits, consent is a social contract between us and the dog, where the dog is choosing to follow along with the foolish and weird things that people do. And it's very important for us and for the dogs because it keeps the dogs in their comfort zone, expands their comfort zone, reduces fear, and it helps the groomer, the vet, the vet tech, or the owner to work with, on, and around the dogs with 
stuff and things and our weird and foolish human things that we want to do. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes and tell all of your friends. Now that we've discussed what consent is and the different types of consent, I want you to also think about consent as a way for us to communicate together. It's communicating that the dog is willing and able to work with us. So what do we need to achieve this type of communication and this type of consent? So we need to be prepared to back off, slow down, pause, or even stop as a response to a dog who is showing discomfort, who is showing that they are uncomfortable, who is worried, right? We can reward and appreciate a dog who shows implied consent. Don't take it for granted because a dog that is just hanging out, being a great dog, they're working hard and they're choosing to work with us. And also when we reward the fact that they're doing that and that when we talk about rewards, I'm not just saying cookies, but just some sort of a something pleasant happens (laughs) to make that behavior continue. We're also ensuring that in the future, if something new happens, the behavior that they've been showing has been strongly rewarded. So something new that might happen. Let me give you an example. I have border collies. And while they are used to being groomed and handled all over, if, um, if I needed to shave a big patch on their side because of some skin issue, because I would never just shave my guys down, you know, <laughs> for as much as my husband asks me to, it's never going to happen, you know, <laughs> but if I needed to shave a patch on their body, that's something they have never had happen before. And it's not something that is, is familiar to them, but we can still use all of that implied consent history we have together with everything else to make sure that they realize, oh, what I am doing right now physically is rewardable. Hanging out and letting the foolish human do these weird things, stuff and things (laughs) to my body is, is rewardable. So the dogs that are already awesome about it, yeah, appreciate that and reward them. Make sure that you recognize that they are working hard and they're choosing to work with you because later in life, there could be things that could be difficult. Um, And another example of things that could be difficult is the dog who's always, always, always been great for grooming and now they have a sore leg. You know, they're getting older. They have some hip problems. Maybe their, their owners are trying to decide if they should do that cruciate ligament surgery and their dog is on the table and The things that we do are not always being done on dogs who are comfortable and healthy. And uh, I think a lot of trainers don't realize that. They're thinking, well, grooming doesn't hurt. Unfortunately, we often are doing grooming on dogs who are sore, right? Like we don't stop grooming dogs because they are getting older, right? The arthritic dog, those, you know, the dog with ear problems, the dog with skin problems, right? They still get groomed. So, If we take a dog who is really, really good for grooming and remind them that we appreciate that, we like that, thank you so much, you're such a good buddy, right? Now, another way that we can achieve this type of communication and consent is we can build a dog's comfort level with the stuff and things (laughs) through informed consent. And informed consent, again, you know, think about they understand what is happening. And that we do that by spending some time teaching them about the objects, the procedures, the techniques, the people, etc. you know, and give it all some context, ways that we might do that, right? The objects, I can't turn a dryer or a clipper back on without saying something like loud noise, right? I just got into the habit. I really think that if I'm at home alone and like were to turn on a blender with nobody else in the building, (laughs) not even any dogs inside, I would still say loud noise because it's just become habit. And it's a good habit. Why not start teaching them about the things and the way things work? Um, Because of that, (laughs) if I were to turn on the dryer without saying anything, it's not the end of the world. Because so, so often I do a loud noise, say loud noise, teaching them about the objects. Things like procedures and techniques. You know what? Before my dogs went to the vet, I spent a little bit of time teaching them the ways they were going to be held for something like blood drawing. It wasn't new, 
It didn't happen just at the vet's office. Now, I have an unfair advantage because I used to be a vet tech, so I do know how they're going to be held for a lot of different things, and I spend some time teaching that. So we can work on this um, knowledge of procedures and techniques and people and give it all some context, and we can do that outside of grooming, and we can do that outside of vet visits, as well as doing it during grooming and vet visits. Sometimes it's as simple as letting them look at the tool we're using. Now look at, not lick peanut butter off of or, or interact with. Um, and that's another thing I find trainers kind of don't necessarily think about, that we don't want dogs interacting with our grooming equipment, much like we don't want dogs interacting with most of the medical equipment. Um, there are things that dogs should not have their mouths on. <laughs> so we want them to be able to see the object, maybe see how it works, um, maybe observe but not necessarily like go over and, you know, sniff it and lick it and <laughs> make it a party. Uh, but the techniques, the people, that's okay to introduce your dog to people, right? Why not? In fact, when you're thinking about building a comfort level, um, one of the things I find myself doing is um, I introduce myself to dogs. Hi, come here, sweetie. Hi, I'm Chrissy. Yeah, I'm Chrissy, because I know their owners are saying things like, Chrissy's coming. And you know what? A lot of these dogs that I've been grooming for a long time have a definite and distinct reaction to Chrissy's coming. Like their reaction is different than reactions to other people. And they're excited. They're like, woohoo, you know, and they're looking for me. And when I get there, they're all excited because, you know, house call groomer. So I'm going to their home. Um, but that's part of teaching them about people. You know, my dogs know their doctor. <laughs> they're like oh it's our doctor and if there's a new technician we introduce them Ooh, who's this new person we don't know her you want to go say hi to him that's nice you know um, but we're giving it all some content some context rather <laughs> um, now another way that we can achieve communication and consent is we can give the dogs a way to opt out if they're afraid or uncomfortable and it's um if you think about, there's a, the opposite is to opt in, right? When they're willing and ready. And in the first part, I listed a few types of expressed consent. And my favorite on the table is the tactile cue, right? Like if I have a body part in my hand, I can hold a back foot and watch what the back foot is doing and feel for what the back foot is doing. I can't necessarily be holding a back foot and trimming a back foot while watching a nose or a chin. So I'm feeling for when like the tail in my hand relaxes and that's tactile, right? That's, that's telling me they're opting in. Like, okay, I am relaxing into her hand and if I remove my thumb, that's my check, right? So I'm often just checking with my thumb and that just means I open my grip and see if they pause there and stay there. And that's how I know I can move on. And then there are some visual cues too. And one example is watching for the dog if they move away. So, you know, you have a dog who's standing and maybe you're trying to scissor that really nice leg and the dog that kind of sidesteps. I would rather, I would rather us all kind of take that little sidestep as a communication of I need a break instead of waiting for them to do something more dramatic. A polite little sidestep, not a big problem. And another example of watching for a visual cue, such as touching a nose target or touching a chin target, when the dog gets into position, that means that I can move forward with the task. When they move out of position, that means I can take a break from the task. Now, nose targeting and touching a chin to a target is a really fun way to work on um, something short duration. Uh, it's great for something like um, a vaccine or maybe a blood draw or just a nail trim. You know, it's not going to hold up for the kind of like long duration grooming process. But for a small portion of the grooming process with two humans, so one is actually just paying attention to nose or chin and the other one is paying attention to getting whatever the task is done. So there are lots of ways for us to use consent, build consent, and have this communication together. So this week's action step 
is to start to recognize the moments where a dog chooses to work with you and to let you work on them. Because just recognizing those moments will help help you start to notice consent and where it happens. If you'd like more information, you can find me at Chrissy at happycritters.net, um, happycrittersdogtraining.com, or you can join the Facebook group, Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast, or the Facebook page, Creating Great Grooming Dogs. I really look forward to hearing from you.